Sinis Fund. <laughs> so scribbled the graffiti author on a decaying brick tenement wall deep in the slums of a large city. While the elements may soon wash these words from the masonry, false beliefs about sin, like this one, will long engrave the minds of millions of humans everywhere. Few people, graffiti artists and professing Christians alike, really understand the biblical doctrine of sin. This state of spiritual blindness is dangerous, for our Savior Jesus Christ gave his life to pay the penalty for sin. Surely anything the demanded that anything that demanded the life of God himself must truly be a matter of life and death for you and me. Now what is the basic doctrine of sin? In spite of the supreme importance of understanding what sin is and what it does, the actual biblical teaching about sin is easy to state in a few words. Sin is transgression against the way of God as defined by God's perfect law. Although the penalty of sin is death, Forgiveness is gladly given by God to those who repent and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and continue in God's way. Now, of course, the usual teachings of this world are, as it has been proven in various other occasions, diametrically opposite from what the Bible says. Although the biblical truth about sin is easy to define, and when fully understood, also deeply profound, nonetheless, the veritable hodgepodge of human misconceptions about the topic is a nightmare of confusion. Some believe that there is no such thing as sin. Others feel that sin is not sin unless the act in question hurts somebody or is against some sort of personal code. Others include almost any and everything under the definition of sin, such as all movies or even wearing any type of clothing or but drab, all black fashions out of the 17th and 19th century or 18th or whatever century anyway, others divide sin into various categories such as original sin and mortal sin and venial sins. Well, truly, dear friends, this subject needs to be made plain once and for all. So, what are the Bible teaching? What is the Bible teaching on sin? When it comes to understanding the subject of sin, the Bible does indeed devote much time to this doctrine and in the plainest words. For example... The Bible leaves no doubt about the definition of sin when it proclaims, Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the, trans is the transgression of the law. This is 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, and I read from the authorized version. So this statement, that sin is the transgression of the law, goes a long way in dispelling many myths about sin, such as the falsehoods that there is no sin or that sin is only sin when it hurts somebody or transgresses your own personal code. It says plainly that sin is just disobedience to God's law, period, regardless of intentions, beliefs or personal codes to the contrary. But sin in this context means far more than only a technical or in the letter violation of one of the Ten Commandments. It includes, as 1 John chapter 5, verse 17 states, all unrighteousness. For we find that Jesus Christ expanded the law of God to include not only transgression in the letter, however broadly defined, but also transgression in the spirit and intent of the law. We read about that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 28. And thus, sin includes not only wrong actions we commit, but also the evil attitudes or ma of mind and thoughts of the heart of every one of us. Since sin is the transgression of the law, it is obvious that there is no sin without law, as Romans 7 verse 7 plainly say. God's law is in force today. That alone will come as a shock to many people indeed. Yet the law is not our enemy, but our friend, even though it defines sin, because in verse 12 of Romans 7 it says the law is holy and just and good. Now this is because God's law exists not merely to provide meaningless do's and don'ts for God's amusement, like mere artificial rules in a board game, but to reveal and define to humans 
What actions and attitudes are harmful? Certainly, when we see how deeply sin can permeate each of our lives, we can easily see how all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. And yet, it is vitally important to realize much more about this subject of sin. For example, we must know that pure temptation, not followed by wrong actions or attitudes or thoughts, is by itself decidedly not sin. It is plain that Jesus Christ himself was tempted severely, as it says in Matthew 4 verse 1, and it says in all points as we are, Hebrews 4 15, and yet did not sin. Therefore we see that sin comes only when the temptation takes root in us, conceives, as James 1 verses 14 and 15 say, conceives and brings forth its evil results. We must also realize that God is not the author of such temptation or its resultant sin. Rather, Satan was the first sinner and is hence its author, as we clearly see revealed in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 through 15. And humans in turn sin when drawn away by the lusts of their own nature as we read in James 1, verses 14 and 15, or tempted by the unseen but powerful evil hand of Satan and his demons, as we read about in Genesis 3, verse 1 through 6, and Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Further, we need to be aware that sin came into the human race from Satan, but through Adam, the first man. Nonetheless, we are all guilty of our own sins and not instead born with the sin of Adam staining us as the teachers of the false doctrine of original sin would have us believe. For as the Apostle Paul wrote, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. Romans 5 verse 12, this is authorized version, uh, translation. Hence the blame for sin belongs in two distinct places, on Satan as its instigator and upon us as its willing participants. Now truly, this more important lesson is the one taught by the symbolism of the two goats in the sacrificial ritual performed by ancient Israel on the Day of Atonement, and that ritual is described in Leviticus chapter 16. Now, no discussion of the topic of sin would scratch its surface, however, without explaining the most important characteristic of sin, its penalty. The penalty is the ultimate, death, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Such a direct and plain Bible statement may astound those who cling to the false belief in the immortality of the soul and who would think that the penalty would be to burn forever in hell fire. But God's plain and direct statement cannot be gainsaid nor doubted. The wages of sin is death. And notice that the wages is the same for all, great and small. God does not categorize sin spiritually, calling some mortal and others venial. All sin is mortal in the sense that it generates the death penalty if unrepented of. Now, that is not to say that same sin is not more morally deprived than other sin, or involves more character destruction, or incurs greater bad results here on earth now, but the spiritual penalty for all sin, the spiritual death penalty, is equal in every case of sin. Yet, the wages of sin are not only death, but include the suffering that such sin may bring in this life, such as broken marriages, wars, and every other type of suffering, and the alienation and cutting off of the sinner from the living eternal God. All that is described in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1 and 2. Now certainly, we who have all sinned, and therefore stand in jeopardy of suffering alienation from God and ultimate death, we need an escape from, and a protection and antidote, antidote to this horrible enemy of sin, Thankfully, we have it through Jesus Christ our Lord as described in Romans chapter 7, verses 13 through 25. Now, with all that has been said about sin, one question still remains. Why does God allow sin? Well, the answer is that sin is a natural possibility arising out of the freedom of choice. 
the free moral agency. God has given us humans. He has given us free moral agency, so therefore sin is a natural possibility arising out of the freedom of choice. Since we have freedom to choose, we have freedom to sin. And we must have freedom to choose if we are to build the character God wants us to build in us, uh, to build in us, since character is by definition the choosing of right over evil. When it comes to sin, the key verses are there in the Bible. Since the topic of sin is so vital to the understanding of the Bible, it is good to remember a few, few key verses on the subject. Here is, here are some. 1 John 3 4 says sin is the transgression of God's law. Romans 6.23 shows that the penalty of sin is death. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2 shows that sin cuts one off from God. Romans 3.23 states that all have sinned. And 1 John chapter 1 verse 19 shows that God is faithful to forgive our sins when we repent of them. Well, friends and brethren, in conclusion, this subject of sin is too important to lie misunderstood in the minds of those whom God would call to salvation. Sin is transgression against the way of God as defined by his perfect law. Although the penalty of sin is death, forgiveness is gladly given by God to those who repent, turn from sinning, and who accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and dedicate their lives to living God's way, obeying his perfect law. Yet, sin may be fun, under quotation mark, it may be fun for a while, but its penalty is anything but fun. It is death. Yet we who can learn what sin is and who bitterly repent of it, we can rely upon the merciful forgiveness of the great God who yearns to give us his kingdom and eternal life.